Hello, welcome to PCAP's fifth Prairie's Got the Goods Week. My name is Caitlin Moreau Seiler and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan or PCAP. Today we will have a webinar about retaining Canada's grasslands using carbon offset markets and a roadmap to quantify grassland soil organic carbon by Varesco Solutions and the Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association. Special today, before we dive into our webinar, there will be an announcement. So I will head it over, hand it over to Cedric to, with Canadian Forge Grasslands Association to take over from here. I'd like to mention before we begin, if you have any questions, just type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time and questions will be answered at the end. All right, Caitlin, can you see my screen there? We can't see your screen, Cedric, you can see us. Try again. There How's we that? Go. There we go. Yeah, Good. That's, in, that's in presenter mode, good. Yes. All right, so thanks so much uh, for the introduction, Caitlin, and thanks to Carolyn and Caitlin and and everybody at uh, at PCAP for the opportunity uh, to slide in with a with a special announcement today. Um, really excited to be able to launch uh, a project that's been two years in the making. Um, so I'm Cedric McLeod. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Forage and Grassland Association. I guess that's a pretty good place to start. And I'll be emceeing our our announcement this morning, this afternoon. Um, so again, two years in the making. Um, we've been at this uh, building of the Canada Grasslands Protocol for the last number of years. You're going to hear John and, and Brian from Varesco Solutions take us through kind of the, the, the journey that we've been on there. Um, but and, and that project is coming to a close here at the end of fiscal year March. And we're starting this new project. We're going to hear from Shell Canada in just a few minutes and some of our other partners. The opportunity we have before us is to take this Canada Grasslands Protocol and um, and get it out onto the landscape. Oh, we're just trying to get that screen to go forward. And so, a couple of things we want to work at here. You know, we want to deploy the protocol. We want to understand how it works. Um, and uh, you can see our partners there on the screen. Uh, land trusts and others. There's there's too many to go through by name, but you can see them. You'll see them here throughout the slide deck. So thanks to those guys for helping make this reality. We want to understand how this works with 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 the trust and and their and their clients. Based on the findings that we get on the landscape, we're going to come back and and modify as necessary. We we understand that this you know this is not the the end point for the protocol. Um, this is the starting point, and and we will be running this as a pilot project. We want to learn what it means and uh, the impact it is going to have with with landowners, uh, and again, um, you know, grow with that, and then I would say probably modify and repeat. So this is a bit of a uh, bit of a longer term process, um, very large project, and really happy to have all the all the partners on that we do. So hats off to everybody for sticking with us for the last two years as we've developed this project. So I want to introduce the Honorable, Honorable Warren Kading, Minister uh, of Environment and MLA for Melville Salt Coats to, to say a few words about you know, the, what this means, what grasslands mean and grassland conservation means to, to the province of Saskatchewan. So just a little background, Minister Keating received his Bachelor of Science in Agriculture from the University of Saskatchewan, worked with Horst Ag, and, uh, and was the owner operator of a Wagon Wheel Seed Corporation for a time. Uh, a long list of, of engagements throughout the Saskatchewan agriculture sector uh, and, and very active in his, in his church and, and his community. Um, he's also the Legislative Secretary for the Minister of Agriculture on, on irrigation expansion as well as the Legislative Secretary to the minister responsible for SASTEL. So with that, Minister Kading, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, love you to, to go ahead and share your comments with us. 
Well, thanks, Edric. And yeah, what a great day when it uh, involves agriculture again at this level in Saskatchewan. So on behalf of the province of Saskatchewan, it is indeed a pleasure uh, to be with you here today to provide our government's perspectives on grasslands conservation and, and soil carbon sequestration. You know, I've, I've spent the last 30 years plus, I guess, of my career in the agriculture sector, involved in the pedigreed seed production and, and retail business in the Churchbridge area, which is 30 miles east of Yorkton. But today, as the Minister of Environment, I, I really do appreciate the contributions that both livestock producers and our ecological sector have provided our province. You know, these two sectors have coexisted while recognizing the need to ensure that our species at risk are protected, uh, understanding the value that, that carbon sinks provide, and really acknowledging that the balancing act is required to, to reduce emissions in Canada. As Saskatchewan embarks on designing its carbon offset program, we appreciate the research and the opportunity that this pilot presents. Saskatchewan is committed to building an offset program that helps the province shift to a lower carbon economy. In the coming weeks, we're going to be engaging with stakeholders, which will provide opportunities for them to present online submissions here in the province. These engagements are going to provide guidance for our ministry in developing a greenhouse gas offset program to assist in our protocol development process. You know, a significant component of our Prairie Resilience Climate Change Strategy involves our output-based uh, performance standards program for industrial emitters. Carbon offsets are going to be one of the tools that our industries are going to be able to utilize as they are designing and implementing new technology to effectively reduce their emissions long term. Saskatchewan's carbon offset program is going to create benefits for industry and create opportunities for farmers, foresters, ranchers, municipalities, and really other businesses who are going to choose to participate. The program is going to build on the excellent work that these sectors currently do in greenhouse gas reductions and are going to recognize the activities and actions that will focus on reducing emissions and sequestering additional carbon. Offset programs are going to provide a tremendous opportunity, not only on the national stage, but really internationally as well. Companies like Google, Amazon, so many of our international airlines and really our multinational tech companies are going to have a chance to purchase carbon credits to offset their emissions. Designing a credible offset program is crucial to being prepared for these opportunities. Both offset producers and purchasers are going to need a high degree of confidence that the carbon credits have real value and can be verified independently. Saskatchewan has already a good start as our agriculture's production methods are recognized around the world. We appreciate the federal government's involvement through the Canadian Agriculture Partnership and its Agri-Assurance Program. Providing funding support for an initiative like this is going to ensure that Canada's grasslands protocol is built by our agriculture and environmental partners, both experts in their own right. To have this diverse group of partners working together towards creating a more sustainable future is something we can all indeed be very proud of. So thank you for allowing me this uh, small opportunity to participate today. And I look forward to the future innovative work that your industry is going to be involved in. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for those comments, Mr. Kading, and, and, and thanks so much for, for uh, you know, for being with us today and, and, and identifying the opportunity we, we, we've got here with this Canada Grasslands Protocol to move things forward and, and certainly echo your comments um, the goal of this project is to make sure that it does work for landowners. So uh, looking forward to working with your constituents there in Saskatchewan. So next up, uh, really pleased to introduce uh, Denise Chang Yen, who's the manager uh, development nature-based solutions at Shell. Uh, in this role, Denise is focused on identifying and developing projects that protect, enhance and restore natural ecosystems in Canada. So a pretty good fit uh, for, for what we're working at. And, and Denise has, has been part of the team for the last two years to get this thing up and off the ground. She is an engineer by trade, so uh, that comes in handy with managing the numbers of partners that we do have on the project. Because uh, as you can imagine, it, it, takes, uh, it takes some organizational skills. So we thank you for that, Denise, and thanks for being with us today. Uh, I invite you to share your comments. Thanks so much, Cedric. Um, wanted to um, acknowledge the, the leadership role that the Canadian Foraging Grasslands Association and Varesco have played in this project. So thank you for getting us here. And also to Minister Kading for his very inspiring words. 
Um, I, I think that there are some who might be wondering why Shell is even involved in a grasslands project. So maybe I'll just provide a little bit of context. Um, Shell is um, one of those companies who has set a net zero target, as Minister Kading mentioned previously. So we aim to become a net zero energy business by 2050 in step with society and our customers. Um, we're becoming a net zero energy business um, not only from our operations, but also from the fuels that we sell and the energy products. So this means that our customers are part of our net zero journey. It also means that for any um, emissions that are left over that we are not able to um, mitigate using technology, we'll be balancing them with offsets, which is where nature-based solutions comes in. Shell is increasingly working with nature to help reduce the overall concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And this is an effective and immediate way to help compensate for emissions that are currently unavoidable. Now, when people think about nature-based solutions, they tend to think about tree planting. And there's certainly a role for tree planting. In fact, Shell has invested in a reforestation project with the Sukhothin nations in the interior of BC recently. But nature-based solutions also includes protecting, enhancing, and restoring many ecosystems, including grasslands. So Shell looks to invest in nature-based solutions across a variety of project types and ecosystems, um, not only for the carbon value, but also for the other environmental benefits, like maintaining habitat that supports biodiversity, and also providing local community benefits where the projects take place. So I'm personally very excited about demonstrating how the farming and ranching community helps to deliver climate solutions through responsible land stewardship. This project will support carbon retention in grasslands while providing other environmental benefits, as well as economic benefits for landowners, not just in the pilot phase, but hopefully well into the future. Shell is pleased to be working with such a di diverse group of organizations, and we each bring a unique perspective and set of skills to the project. We believe this is going to be an innovative and high quality initiative and Shell is keen to play our part in supporting. We're also looking forward to working with the provincial and federal governments in Canada to develop a protocol to support those landowners who want to retain grasslands, one of Canada's most endangered ecosystems. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you here today. Thanks very much for that, Denise, and, and thanks certainly for, you know, your, again, your dedication and your investments of, of time and resource into this, into this project. Um, you know, as, as we go through our list of speakers here, I'm just getting more and more excited about what we can do to, to hit the ground. And, and I guess uh, next up, we're going to get comments uh, from a few of our project partners, but I do just want to take a moment and, and recognize you do see the uh, you've heard Shell, you've heard CFJ Varesco, uh, Government of Canada through the Ag, uh, Agriculture Partnership uh, has is providing funding to this, a so hats off to, to, the, to the Ag Reassurance Program. But you see there in that middle line, Nature Conservancy Canada, Southern Alberta Land Trust Society, Ducks Unlimited Canada, Legacy Land Trust Society, Alberta Beef Producers and Saskatchewan Stock Growers Association. So uh, many, many thanks to to those folks on the conservation side and, and the beef industry side who have helped us to put this project together and, and who are going to help us uh, to take it forward. So um, with that, I'll you know invite comments from, from Tom Lynch Staunton, who's the regional vice president uh, for Alberta at the uh, Nature Conservancy of Canada and had the pleasure of working with Tom uh, over the last uh, number of years when he was with the Canadian Cattlemen's Association and, and then with Alberta Beef Producers as their head of government relations and, and policy. So I kind of built that working relationship and always appreciated Tom's dedication to, to the grassland system and, and, and what it means for sustainability uh, of both the landscape and, and the cattle sector. Uh, and I think that certainly comes from, you know, his, his uh, continued involvement with the family ranch uh and uh helping with the co-managing that fourth generation cattle operation up in the foothills there of alberta so tom uh over to you thanks so much cedric you can hear me okay can okay super yeah thanks for that uh kind introduction um 
you know, I'm really excited and proud to be working on this project with the diverse array of uh, stakeholders and partners in it. Um, you know, getting right into it, um, coming from both a rancher's perspective, but also uh, my new role with the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Uh, one of the challenges that, that you know, we've identified um, within the land trust community is continued conversion of grasslands, um, continued loss of grasslands. We know that we've got about 26% uh, of native intact grasslands throughout the prairie provinces in Canada. So much of those grasslands have been lost and this is a you know, significant threatened ecosystem, not just for Canada, but for the world. And so as an organization that works on trying to conserve habitat, um, and habitat and of importance for not just plant species, but the wildlife that also inhabit uh, that land. Uh, it's become increasingly important for us to concentrate on grassland conservation. Um, but the challenge is we can't do that alone. Um, we have to work with a variety of partners and one of those partners is the landowner community that uh, uses these lands, namely ranchers raising livestock on these grasslands, keeping them as working landscapes because these are the one of the primary stewards in Canada of these grasslands so far. But there are challenges still to conversion. Some of those are economic, some of those are risk-based uh, challenges that many ranchers face and sometimes they have to make difficult decisions um, to keep their family business going. Um, and so looking for opportunities to recognize the value that these ranchers provide to the ecosystem where both um, uh, organization like Nature Conservancy of Canada can, can help these ranchers get, get conservation values and recognize that value through the partnerships that we do, the conservation agreements that we work with ranchers on, um, but also trying to find opportunities to recognize those other ecosystem services and retention of carbon and carbon sequestration is certainly one of those opportunities. And we know that once land is converted, um, particularly to farming, but to al also other development, that we lose 30 to 50 percent of the carbon stored in that grassland. And we also know that the best way to mitigate that loss is to keep that land intact in the first place. Um, I, I always like this, this quote out of um, uh, the Food Climate Research Network out of the University of Oxford. Um, and they, I, I pull this up quite often in a document they wrote about uh, grazed, it's called Grazed and Confused. And it says, whatever the scope for sequestration, essential to emphasize is the importance of ensuring that grazing management and indeed all ag management keeps existing carbon in the ground in the first place. Released carbon causes permanent warming. However, avoided carbon release is therefore even more important to trying to, than trying to sequester it. So that is why we are so interested in this. It gives another opportunity to keep ranchers ranching on the landscape, um, providing them with a little bit of a, a conservation dividend um, it, when, they're, when they're trying to continue ranching and keeping that ranch intact. So we see this as a, such a great opportunity to retain these sensitive rangelands that we've got and help the landowner community um, perhaps generate some increased revenue through, through carbon credits. And I think I'll leave it there. Thanks, Cedric. Excellent, thanks, Tom. Very well said, and thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that quote. Uh, very, uh, very fitting for our announcement today. Appreciate that. So our last speaker, uh, and then uh, we'll get back to our regular, regularly scheduled program. Uh, probably doesn't need uh, a lot of introductions out west, but Tracy Scott, with who's the the head of industry and government relations in Alberta for Ducks Unlimited Canada. Uh, raised right there on the family farm in, in Camrose and, and been working 31 years with, with Ducks Unlimited Canada uh, in various roles. Um, Trace has been a pretty valuable contributor to the development of this project 
you know, with his extensive experience in all elements of wetland mitigation and restoration, you know, a, across the landscape, Tracy has, you know, provided Government Alberta and other partners with advice on real world considerations of policy development and implementation, including ag sector engagement. And uh, again, the, the contributions that, that Tracy has made to this project have been certainly on the ground, uh, very practical and, and helping us to stay focused. So, uh, Tracy, I invite you to, to say a few words. Well, uh, thank you, Cedric, for those kind words. Um, very much uh, proud and, and pleased to be a part of this, this team. Uh, you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. And uh, just want to emphasize we've got a great team. Um, I think Tom, uh, Tom really hit on something that uh, I want to emphasize is the fact that loss of natural infrastructure actually is in all intents and purposes an emission. So if we can retain that natural infrastructure, uh, that's, a, that's a very positive thing. I want to speak just a little bit about, about partnerships in general. Our conservation work, DU's conservation work, is dependent entirely on effective partnerships. And that includes Canada's farmers and ranchers. I see our farming and ranching community as the stewards of our grasslands and, and their associated wetlands. And they are, for, for DU and the others in this meeting today, one of our most important partners. But as has already been mentioned, grasslands and the ecosystem services they provide to society are at risk of conversion. And at the end of the day, uh, I think we all know agriculture is a business. And uh, whether or not to retain the grasslands and associated wetland habitat is largely a business decision. So through our conservation programs, we work with our landowner partners to make grassland and wetland conservation good business. Intact grasslands, as has already been mentioned, provide a host of important ecosystem services in addition to the carbon sequestration, provision of important habitat for waterfowl and other wildlife, Blood and drought attenuation, sediment and contaminant filtration, and preservation of native plant species are just a few examples of what are often called co-benefits provided by intact grasslands. And these are benefits that all Canadians enjoy. So that's what, what I'm excited about this project. We're, we're, we're providing a very rich bundle of value um, as, as a cooperative to Canadians, and, and we need to continue to emphasize that. I, uh, I think Tom covered a lot of the, the points I wanted to speak to. We uh, generally do. I really value the partnerships. And I just want to just thank that partnership, thank the members involved for the leadership and vision of the partners uh, leading to this pilot, including Shell for stepping forward, CFGA, the other land trusts, Foresco, and all the other organizations involved. And of course, most importantly, our landowner partners. I, I know I repeat that over and over again. But it's really the folks who are the stewards of our grasslands that are the ones who make this possible. And so I view this as, as taking a big step forward to providing another tool uh, for our landowner partners to make a good business opportunity for them. So that they can not only retain the grasslands and remain sustainable, but also the ranches themselves. Uh, you know, this is another way to help ranchers uh, maintain sustainable uh, operations for years to come. So I'm uh, very much looking forward to the next chapter and thank you so much. Wonderful, thanks for that. Thanks for that, Tracy. And uh, yeah, thanks Thanks for highlighting the, the importance of the partnership. Um, you know, we mentioned the land trust and you see there on the, the bottom line of, of our partners, you know, this project, like say we're, we're seeking to deploy and learn and and redo and modify and then learn some more and and deploy some more and so part of that is is our partners with radical balance and bright spot carbon or bright spot climate sorry and the climate action reserve and regrow so you know this this whole this whole project is about taking the protocol all the way to the end uh you know to to the demand side of the market uh, with, with our player, with our partner here, Shell. So we're gonna learn every single facet of, of what works and what doesn't with this, and we're gonna seek to modify it as necessary. So thanks to for, for those partners and, 
and uh, and for our, our land trust partners and the conservation community. And and again, a, you know, a, a big hats off to to Varesco and Shell um, for for helping helping us to to move this project through. I know there's been a lot of time and, and effort and, and thought process put forward to this, and and uh, very very happy to be launching this project today. And and uh, I'll give the final nod, I guess, to to the government of Canada through the Agriculture Partnership Program. Uh, certainly wouldn't be possible without their funding through the Agri Assurance Program. So thanks so much uh, for that and uh, looking forward to moving this out on the landscape. So the final thing I will say, you know, we've got some information there. If you're a landowner and you're, you're interested in, in being part of this, certainly reach out to to any of the, the um, our partners there on, on list. You can see them listed there. Uh, they'll get you in touch with us. There's Jonathan and I's contact information. Um, like I say, if you're a landowner, if you're an NGO, if you want more information, if you want to be involved, certainly reach out uh, and, and, and we, can, we can make that happen. Um, we're also going to be uh, launching some information on the, on the CFGA website, so you can check us out there at www.canadianfga.ca or just Google the Canadian Forage and Grassland Association, you'll be able to find us there. So. Um, with that, I will again nod to all the partners, nod to the landowners. Looking forward to seeing you, uh, seeing uh, you at, a, at an, an acre near you very soon. So thanks for that. Thanks for being with us, Minister Kading, and uh, Caitlin. I'll pass it back over to you to our regular scheduled program. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just take a second here. Perfect. So before we continue on with our Prairie's Got the Goods Week webinar, I'd like to state that we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original care caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. Um, I'd also like to note to all of our attendees, uh, we have over 180 people online, which is fantastic. Um, and so you will be muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have any questions, just type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. If you're on a cell phone, you can send your question by chat. And this presentation is being recorded and it will be uploaded to the PCAP YouTube channel in the near future. Uh, Prairie's Got the Goods Week would not be possible without our sponsors. I would like to sincerely thank our presenting sponsors, Sask Energy and Wildlife Habitat Canada, as well as our supporting sponsors, Eco-Friendly Sask and Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association. We have four presenters today for our webinar, uh, Karen hogan Koiza, Dr. Brian McConkey, Jonathan Elcock, all of Resco Solutions Inc, as well as Cedric McLeod of the Canadian Forge and Grasslands Association. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Jonathan. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Uh, just share my screen. <clears throat> Can you see my screen now? Yes, perfect. Sorry. Well, thanks very much for the introduction and the opportunity to present here, uh, Caitlin, and and to uh, Extend that thanks to PCAP and all the uh, all the sponsors there, and uh, also thanks to all the um, all the partners that were just mentioned um, uh, on the on the announcement of this uh, this project. Um, very much looking forward to getting going on uh, on on this pilot project with all of you. Um, <clears throat> so our our webinar today is is uh, very much uh, in keeping with the the pilot project. Um, the title is retaining Canada's grasslands using carbon offset markets um, and, and a roadmap to quantify grassland soil organic carbon uh, beyond the, the, the current opportunities. And really, um, we wanted to take you through um, a bit of a journey of, of how we ended up here, why we ended up here with the, the Canada Grasslands uh, Projects Protocol, um, and then get into uh, some of the other, other opportunities that we're, we're creating through the Soil Organic Carbon Roadmap. Um, and I'll pass over to, to Brian at, uh, at that point to, to describe some of the, the up, upcoming opportunities and, and ideas that we're having around that. So, um, as Caitlin said, um, there's, there's probably going to be quite a lot of information here. So, um, please Put your, your questions in the chat as I go through and um, hopefully we'll have time to circle back at the end. Um, I'll try and keep this to half an hour, 30 minutes. 
Um, so, and then, you know, if, if anybody's able to stay on at the, at the end for, uh, for questions, happy to answer any questions that, that come up during the presentation. So first of all, the, the landscape for grassland carbon, this is really kind of a, a story of, of where we've come from and why we've ended up where we've ended up. Um, first, I just wanted to kind of take a second to note um, what might be obvious to some people um, in terms of uh, how we quantify soil organic carbon um, and the difference between soil organic carbon stocks and soil organic carbon uh, change. So soil organic carbon stocks um, are a measurement of the existing soil carbon store uh, within, the, within the soil, usually measured within the top 30 to 50 centimeters of, of the soil. And really the, the total soil carbon stock uh, or storage is what we actually measure when we go out into a field, take a sample and measure the soil, soil carbon within that sample. Um, we're really measuring the soil carbon stock in that case. Um, conversely, uh, the soil carbon change is a change in total soil carbon stock over time. So we can measure the change by measuring soil carbon stock at time A, and then um, at, at, at next time, you know, time B, we can then take that uh, sample again, measure soil carbon stock um, at that time B, and then measure the change over that time. Obviously, time. Um, Influences on soil carbon stocks uh, over time uh, are, are really broad and, and varied. Um, soil carbon stocks can be influenced by uh, the weather, by the climate, by land management, uh, lots of different variables involved in, in um, changes to soil carbon stocks over time. Really the main point here is that soil carbon change um, over time is very incremental. We're looking for uh, you know, a change of usually less than 1%. Uh, in total soil carbon stock per year. So you can see looking at that, they're very small, they're very small change in soil carbon stock between time A and time B um, can be really difficult to, to accurately measure, um, particularly uh, to the accuracy that's needed for uh, soil carbon markets, uh, sorry, carbon offset markets. Um, and given the accuracy of the measurement tools that we currently have available, and also the variability in soil carbon stock uh, measurements over time and over space, different geographies, it's actually really difficult to detect um, a meaningful, meaningful soil carbon change to the accuracy that's required uh, for carbon, carbon offset markets. So a few years ago, we started off looking at how can we um, generate carbon offsets for grassland, um, grassland soil carbon in Canada. Uh, we started off looking at a measurement-based protocol where we would look at soil organic carbon stock measurements over time. We'd take a measurement at time A. A few years later, we'd take a second measurement at time B. Um, this type of a protocol would allow land managers to implement their own management practices. There's no uh, uh, prescriptive land management practice that a landowner would have to follow. We're literally measuring the, the difference, um, the, the soil carbon change over time. Um, and yeah, offsets would be awarded based on the, the actual measurements that were taken. We, um, we deemed that approach not feasible um, at the time uh, because uh, for, well, for a number of reasons, uh, first of all, soil, soil sampling costs and workload would be uh, very prohibitive. Um, as I mentioned, the high variability in soil carbon stock measurements over different geographies and over time would mean that a lot of samples need to be taken and that, that gets too costly in the context of carbon offsets. Remote sensing technologies, are they could provide a solution, but, but as yet, uh, I think the jury's still out on, on whether we'll get there with remote sensing technologies and uh, those technologies aren't, aren't available uh, just yet, at least. And um, being able to link measurements, soil, soil carbon measurements or samples with biogeochemical models could reduce those sampling requirements. Um, but we weren't quite there with the, with the process and the, the models to, to enable us to do that at that stage. So that was a uh, measurement-based protocol deemed not feasible at, at the stage that we were, we were looking at this. So then we looked at um, a practice-based protocol 
Um, Practice-based protocol, uh, we use models to estimate soil organic carbon change from specific land management practices. Um, uh, this type of protocol would define or prescribe the land management practices um, that would be needed to generate carbon offset for grassland carbon, um, but those offsets would be awarded based on those, those modeled estimates, so there's no need for sampling in that case. Um, it would be maybe probably cheaper to, to implement. The problem is that, like I said, the high variability in management practices themselves and the soils uh, means that it's really difficult to, to get accurate estimates from soil organic carbon models. There's, there's really a lack of scientific consensus right now on the impact of land management practices on soil organic carbon change. And finally, this, this type of protocol would be prescriptive uh, to a certain extent in, in terms of the type of um, management practices that would be allowed um, for which carbon offsets could be, could be generated. So again, um, practice-based protocol deemed a no-go at, at that time. So then we moved on to our final uh, idea, which was um, an unavoided conversion protocol. So the avoided conversion protocol uh, would use default coefficients to estimate soil organic carbon stock loss uh, from an assumed conversion or loss of that soil organic carbon stock. Um, the main point uh, for, for this protocol would be to prove that the grassland is at risk of conversion, i.e. the soil organic carbon stocks within that grassland are at risk of, at risk of loss. Um, and offsets would be um, awarded for ensuring that at-risk grasslands are preserved and that soil organic carbon stock is preserved. Um, so we were able to proceed with this type of a protocol, um, as you know. Um, we, we have well-developed science for so soil carbon loss from grassland conversion, um, developed for, the, uh, for the, the Canada's National Inventory Reporting. Um, on, on greenhouse gas emissions at, at the national level. Um, it's the simplest approach that we, we can take um, using the current knowledge and technology um, that's, that's available right now. Um, and the primary concern is, is grassland and soil carbon loss, which, um, you know, as, as, as uh, some of the partners mentioned there, is, is uh, one of the key uh, uh, kind of focal points for, for, for reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, or, or um, we, we should be focused on preserving those existing soil carbon stocks. Um, worth noting that management for soil carbon increases or so ongoing soil carbon sequestration is, is not uh, rewarded through this type of a protocol but um, again it's, it has its benefits in terms of its simple approach and, um, uh, and the, having the science that's, that's available to use right now. So we proceeded with the avoided conversion uh, protocol. Um, these are some numbers that we pulled for Alberta, um, although this, this type of pattern would be replicated across the prairies. Um, just looking at the rate of perennial grassland loss um, per year, uh, you can see 52,000 hectares of perennial grassland loss per year. Uh, on average is, is, is one number that we came up with. Um, and that's the really significant loss of that soil carbon store from, from those grasslands that are, that are lost. Um, so the question uh, to ask is, could soil carbon, uh, could carbon markets provide um, a solution to preventing uh, some of this loss of uh, this, those soil carbon stores? So um, onto the, the protocol itself, uh, you know, we, we went through um, a bit of a process figuring out which protocol was going to use, uh, was going to work for Canada. This is the protocol that we've we've uh, been able to um, uh, get approved in the Climate Action Reserve voluntary market for Canada. Uh, so I'll I'll introduce the protocol itself and um, a little bit what it's about. Um, as I mentioned, it's the first carbon offset opportunity for Canadian grassland managers. Um, it's the first avoided conversion opportunity in Canada. Um, again, looking at uh, taking a slightly different perspective on 
um, maintaining existing carbon stores that are at risk of loss. Um, and it's also the first protocol under the Climate Action Reserve voluntary market for Canada. So the critical point to consider with this protocol is the baseline assumption, uh, which is which is basically a, a business as usual um, uh, case uh, that we assume is going to happen without the intervention of the carbon offset opportunity. So we assume in this case that the grassland will be converted to an annual cropping system. Um, the implications of, of making that assumption is that the credits, as I've, as I've said, are generated for the avoided loss of those soil carbon stores, but the assessment of the risk of that conversion or the risk of that loss of that soil carbon store is absolutely fundamental to this protocol. Um, so we have to prove that that grassland is at risk of, of conversion. Um, on the flip side, the project itself is the act of actually conserving that grassland and making sure that the that grassland is not going to be converted. And that's done through um, a qualified land conservation agreement, which could take the form of, a, of an easement or a servitude or an agreement or a covenant, um, or some other kind of legally binding um, agreement that's placed on the land title. Um, we must also consider some of the emissions from the project scenario. So i.e. emissions that are caused from maintaining the grassland that must be counted. So a good example of that would be um, grazing cattle. We've got to uh, account for the emissions from grazing cattle on grasslands that wouldn't have otherwise occurred if that grassland was converted uh, to, um, uh, to another land use. Uh, so to be eligible, um, the grassland or the, the piece of parcel of land must have been uh, in a grassland system for at least 10 years. Um, the definition of grassland is, is uh, fairly relaxed. We're, we're looking at native and tame grasslands uh, in this protocol. Um, the risk of conversion, like I said, is absolutely fundamental, assessing that risk. Um, we need to look at the legal viability of the of of that risk of conversion. So um, we need to prove that there's no legal land, legal protection um, on that piece of land that pre prevents that grassland from being converted. Uh, we also have to uh, prove that the, the soil or, or the piece of land is physically suitable for producing uh, annual crops. Uh, so we look at soil classes, we look at the slope uh, and moisture restrictions or any other kind of restrictions that um, might prevent annual crops from being grown. And then finally, we look at the financial viability. So we, we look at the value of, of um, that parcel of land as cropland um, and also and compare it to the value of that parcel of land as grassland to prove that, that the um, there is a financial driver to converting that parcel of land to annual cropping, an annual cropping system. Um, projects can consist of multiple discrete parcels. So um, it doesn't have to be one continuous piece of grassland. Uh, it can be multiple uh, pieces, multiple parcels. Um, and actually, most of these projects, um, uh, it seems like most of these projects wouldn't be, wouldn't be feasible without um, lumping together uh, lots of smaller projects into, into one larger project. Uh, the basic requirements, uh, as I said, uh, uh, a qualified land conservation agreement is needed to prove that the grassland is not uh, um, is not going to be um, uh, converted. Um, that's the that's the the basis of of the project itself. Um, I have no breaking of ground here, um, although I think on a case by case basis uh, we can look at some minimal tillage for rejuvenation or weed control. Um, moderate grazing and moderate haying is allowed. Um, really, this uh, everybody will ask what moderate grazing and moderate haying um, means. It's really, you know, we're, we're preserving that soil organic carbon store, so we don't want to be um, overgrazing or over haying or, or mismanaging the grassland uh, in another way that, that leads to that loss of that soil organic carbon store. And the way that we assess that is through this ecosystem health assessment every six years. Um, if, if an assessment was, was failed for one of the year, 
uh, for, for one assessment, then um, uh, the, the, the project isn't void. We just uh, have to come up with a plan to um, rectify that, um, with whatever the situation is, uh, to ensure that the, the ecosystem health assessment in the next six years, um, you know, gets us back on track and, and re, uh, retains that soil organic carbon store. Um, and monitoring is required for the full permanence term. Um, monitoring really is, is uh, I think, going to be fairly um, minimal for this this uh, protocol, but um, that's one of the things that we're going to be investigating during the pilot. So that was the um, you know our journey from uh, well a few years ago I suppose up until now where we have the uh, the first kind of uh, carbon offset opportunity for for Canadian grassland owners. Um, in the meantime, we've also been doing some work on on um, going beyond that that first opportunity and increasing opportunities for soil organic carbon um, uh, incentives um, on Canadian grasslands. So um, I'll hand over to uh, Dr. Brian McConkie to take us through some of the work we've been doing on uh, on the soil organic carbon roadmap. Yeah, thanks, John. I'll just let you uh, manage the PowerPoint, if that's okay. And good afternoon, everyone. I think this is a, a very exciting time for, for grassland management with these opportunities and in, in offsets. So um, next slide, John. So um, yeah, like if we start, you know, John has already mentioned the, the, the challenges we have in, in, in the quantifying uh, organic carbon change for existing grassland. And so really, with the help of, of significant funding uh, from Albert Innovates, we looked at that then challenge of how do we uh, quantify soil organic carbon change for, for the existing grasslands due to the management. So this would be the other side of the, not just preserving it, but providing extra income stream for the current managers uh, who are doing a good job on managing their, their grasslands. And that will also, of course, uh, make uh, the, the grasslands more profitable and therefore also help to keep their uh, conservation so you know, we, uh, so we we looked at through all the uh, through some funding uh, with the agriculture greenhouse gas program uh, to the Canadian Forest Grasslands Association, and looked at sort of the, assess some of the opportunities, and said so we we came up to that, and and um, and uh, so we also we looked at could we kind of work towards sort of a practice based carbon offset protocol, and that was not really uh, um, something that was going to work well. Next slide. And, uh, you know, then, so then we looked, of course, at, at measurement, but as John has said, you know, in his introduction was, you know, variability, the heterogeneity, it just takes so many samples, particularly in a, in a grazing land situation, which is often very complex, multiple pastures worked in, in, in sequences, uh, very difficult, and of course, the whole exercise of trying to do this can, can uh, not only be expensive, but also disruptive. And, uh, you know, on the other, challenge we have is that of course you know the, the practices vary so much between farms so you know, we talk about adaptive multi paddock grazing well the adaptive part means not only adapting to the environment but adapting to the economics adapting to the you know, individual situations on each farm or ranch so you know this makes it very complicated to sort of define what is a what is a practice uh, and then so that uh, was a, game, a clear limitation next slide so uh, you know, one thing is, um, you know, we knew that we needed good numbers of what is actually happening to organic carbon, and we know that takes big quality data, and it takes many years to do that. You know, as John's also mentioned, to remote sensing technologies that could be very valuable to support um, the measurement and quantification of soil organic carbon. They're really not there yet for, for regulators or buyers. And uh, we also do have, though, much research that has gone on and is going on, uh, providing uh, uh, information on soil organic carbon change. But um, but really, that has not really been uh, well compiled so that the collective database, so that we can uh, use it effectively to enhance our scientific understanding and also even support uh, um, um, protocols that, that, that deal with uh, improved um, the effects of improved management on uh, grassland carbon. Next slide. So, so we developed what we call the Soil Organic Carbon Roadmap, uh, 
and uh, and so we had multiple um, steps in this process. The first was obviously was simply to look what are other people doing in the world. Certainly, in a sense, this this challenge with, with grasslands is, is not unique to Canada. In fact, it, it's pretty much all over the the world. Uh, uh, dealing with grasslands again, they tend to be more complex. Well, the management of grasslands tends to be more complicated and varied than say uh, cropland. So you know, certainly we looked there. So we started, you know, drafting out what could um, be the best approaches that would use what we already know, what we already have. How can it be low cost uh, accurate, but particularly how can it be feasible and how can it be done, you know, on a timeline that, you know, is workable because we have these huge opportunities in the next few years and we want to be able to take advantage of those. So we also engage with a lot of stakeholders, um, academia, research, governments, uh, those technology industry consultants and other technical experts and so that was kind of a you know so looking really about the technical side and then we also had a working group and we still three of those working group we had three, three meetings and then we also had a broader workshop that included many more stakeholders particularly on the on the production side and it's been on the on the offset buyer side so that we you know got a, a, a good feedback as sort of where we were going and um, we also um, recognize that you know, through this process, this is a lot of work ongoing that could be probably incorporated into Sligana Carbon uh, Roadmap, a lot of existing sites that could become monitoring sites for Sligana Carbon Change. Next slide. So our you know, approach that uh, met, you know, the, that, that, that came through the technical working group, there's had multiple meetings as well as email, um, exchanges and so forth and then uh, that we work with you know biogeochemical models these are models that are on the on the computer or computer models and then they um, would kind of provide the the, the the basis of the quantification but we have to have monitoring support and that monitoring support in particular would we, we knew we had to underpin these models with good observations of solid organic carbon change these these would Calibrate these, calibrate the models. These would validate the models. These would allow us to uh, recognize where the models weren't working or where we were missing, where it was, you know, whether I'm uh, not capturing carbon change correct or, or or not capturing carbon change at all. And so, you know, we really, you know, so we recognize that this is not just modeling. It's modeling and the modeling, the monitoring support of this organic carbon change and also the practices that are going on the land on those monitoring sites is, is really important so you know we knew we had to make sure that um these this solid guy carbon data set covered sort of the range of practices land types and weathers that we would expect in the area that we were interested in and we really started off we had a national working group so we really said what would we need to do this nationally and and then realizing though that you know we can and it's logical in fact to to, to build this this whole system in a sense piecemeal where you have um the need and you have the, the willingness and you, you have the opportunity that you can build there and you can always expand it. We knew we needed, you know, we knew we could use past measurements of solid organic carbon change. Uh, we would help inform uh, a lot of the modeling uh, accuracy, but we also knew we needed to have some ongoing measurements. Uh, the, the types of management are changing rapidly. Of course, there's this climate change going on, change in, in you know, um, uh, size of animals and, and and so forth. The things that are happening is that you can't just take something from 20 years ago and assume that it applies still. So we knew we had to have some ongoing measurements as part of this uh, monitoring. We wanted to make sure that you know that we could you know uh, leverage everything we could to keep the cost down, make it versatile. And we also knew that uh, you know the modeling really well suited the the offset uh, challenge because we knew that then you could get annual estimates of of carbon change so credits could be done annually or issued annually and then uh, obviously then there'd be annual payments but also too important in, in an offset system is you also have to have you know what uh, the estimate of what would have happened had there not been the project with improved management and so the, since that in many most cases is um is uh you obviously don't have that because you've already made the changes for the project so you really have to model that sort of hypothetical or counterfactual case of what is called business as usual so the modeling approach then really was sort of ideally suited to the offset 
system. Next slide. Um, maybe I should go back to the other slide because there was something on the side there I didn't talk about, John. Maybe just so again, I mean, maybe to uh, kind of highlight, I mean, the, the quantification uh, in that center box, you know, it's from, from the model. Um, but the underneath that model, again, is, is the whole monitoring network of all of uh, things. But we also need lots of data that goes into the model. So we need estimates of what's happening on the farm, of course, in an in offset project, the, those that are involved and enrolled in that are in, in that project, of course, would provide that. But we don't, or certainly would be using remote sense data um, of, of the pastures as well as weather data and, and soils data. And then so from all those, you know, with the underpinning of the actual carbon change and different scenarios, different systems, I should say, and then the, to test to make sure the model's working correctly, then we can put in the more site-specific information for the particular farm or actually break down a particular pasture uh, on, on the farm or ranch and then come up with an estimate of soil kind of carbon change for that, for, for, for that pasture, for that farm ranch, for that project. Next slide. So we called this uh, important op network uh, of observations. Uh, we came up with this name, and I guess we're happily would take on if someone could if could identify a better acronym. But anyways, we we're called CAFCON, or the Canadian Forage and Grassland Observation Network. Again, this is that network of observations that really underpin the whole system. So uh, again, we were thinking nationally, so a national set of monitoring sites collecting high quality data, so cam. Um, carbon and, and the associated land use and management data that goes with that. Uh, it's definitely, you know, that data needs to be made available to those that are working with the model so that uh, we can you know, test the models and make sure that they, they work well and they can make predictions uh, both across the geographical and temporal um, scales that, that we're, we're looking at. And also, you know, important then, there is um, Many issues, I guess, in, in sharing data and, and whatever, and intellectual property and so forth. So, you know, a major part of this network, in fact, will be in some ways um, uh, building the, the, the structure that, that, um, that allows the different uh, stakeholders and, and uh, uh, collaborators to, to be able to share their data in a way that can be of most use uh, um, for this important purpose of, of supporting the quantification of carbon change because if we don't have those estimates of carbon change and really right now in a sense like the grasslands and and um, and even forage lands are, are somewhat ignored you know sense of, well what's the opportunity there well we don't know we can't quantify it so it's really important that we we, uh, we change that narrative and and uh through this uh calf God and to provide that sharing of all the information we have. And then certainly, as we mentioned, one of our uh, activities was to identify all of the existing sites that are already out there. And there's many, many kind of demonstration sites and whether they're ongoing. In some cases, it's just really a matter of probably adding on some with higher quality solid again, carbon measurements um, to really to make those sites then really become valuable as part of this calf god. Next slide. So again, this kind of just uh, kind of just another view of what this is. Uh, calf gone again. It's not that dissimilar from the short, uh, the smaller version of this that we saw in a previous slide. But again, it really it's really the kind of the question: What is in that observation network? Well, certainly we have um, you know really experiments or, or carefully controlled demonstrations, particularly when they have multiple treatments. Those are kind of key in it. But also we need to take advantage of where we have. Um, um, you know, sort of what we call across the fence comparisons that are particularly valuable. Um, you know, that way you can we can test different systems as you know real practical uh, commercial uh, operating uh, farming systems, and then make some comparisons there. And and uh, we also recognize in some cases, you know, we, you know, because we're modeling, we don't always have to have a comparison. Uh, that in some cases where you know. Um, there's, you know, there's even one field, one one farm or ranch is doing some interesting things and wants to become involved. Like that individual field or, or individual farm or pieces of that farm could actually be also become part of the net, the the calf god. So it's really quite flexible as 
to what's there. And then again, it works with other data sources to come up with these with these estimates. So, um, uh, so again, it gives us this, uh, uh, the roadmap then, you know, really addresses these two things. Like how do we get these general estimates of soil organic carbon change given all, you know, what, what we can know uh, and what we do know, you know, we already have available using it the most effectively, but also, you know, in some ways stretching that and trying to build this community-based, you know, collaboration so that we can continue to make sure that we have the, the data to, to, to underpin uh, this, uh, the, the quantification systems that are necessary for successful offset systems. Next slide. Okay, I think this is for you then, John, now. Yeah, Thanks. I can take over. Thank, thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, so obviously the, the CAFCON, we've got a lot, lot of work to do there, including planning a better acronym, potentially. Um, but the, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big, it's a big amount of work to take on. So we wanted to break it down into a, a shorter term strategy of, of actually, you know, first just compiling all the information, all the data sets that we have and all the, the potential monitoring sites that we have into, um, a, a, you know, a, an initial uh, repository or platform and to develop those, those data sharing agreements and, and all that. Uh, kind of infrastructure that needs to go along with that. So that's our short-term strategy is to start by proving the concept through this this data, uh, initial data repository platform. And then the long-term strategy, of course, is to then design and develop the, the full uh, CAFCON network, um, obviously secure, secure funding to do so, um, and then continual improvement and, and um, maintenance of, of that network over time is a, is a uh, a, bit, a big piece of the puzzle too. Um, so right now we're we're um, uh, working on that um, kind of funding piece and and developing that that um, initial uh, data repository um, platform. Um, we've prepared that uh, a list of research studies and data sets that that we know are available in Canada, um, and, and we're we're adding to that list. Um, we're putting together the team to take take this forward. Um, the the Canadian Forage and Grassland Association could play a secretariat role in this. Um, we we the feedback from the stakeholders is that um, housing this in in government or in the private sector might be risky um, due to uh, you know that this has to be a long term um, monitoring network um, and you know policy changes both in public and private sector can can uh, um, can be can be difficult to uh, to keep the to maintain this type of a network over over the long term, um, and so we're we're reaching out for for funding to to all sorts of different um, organisations and, and opportunities right now. Um, so yeah, with that, I think I'll uh, we'll end the the presentation and we can uh, we can start to feel some questions but um yeah just want to thank everybody at, uh, at PCAP um all the sponsors and and uh, and, and Cedric as well for the opportunity to uh, to present here thanks very much Thank you. Thank you very much for the fantastic presentation. Um we do have a number of questions if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay, um, the first question is from a listener named Sarah. Uh, she says, equating native and tame grasslands for this program seems misguided. Converting a native grassland to tame still has significant implications on carbon loss. Is it possible for carbon, for native grasslands to be prioritized, not to mention that they have better ecological function? Do you have any comments about that? Yes, um, it, it gets to the underlying uh, science, but underneath the, the avoided conversion protocol. So it's key to remember that this is an avoided conversion protocol. We're not, we're not, you know, it's not a res restoration protocol. But the, the science underlying this protocol uh, is based off of the National Inventory Report science, and it takes the the soil organic carbon stocks. Um, for, I think from from ta Brian can probably answer better, but the tame tame grasslands as a, as a as a base level, um, and that's the way that um, the, the the coefficients are generated for, for this protocol. So we kind of have to take those the, the sort of a conservative approach to to how we quantify that soil organic carbon uh, stock. Brian, did you want to add to that? Probably. 
Well, no, I think it's a pretty good answer. I mean, there is a you know a little bit of difference, and there's captured someone in the prairies, I guess, a little bit more carbon loss than native, but. Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, the other thing too is you've got to remember you're looking at land that's most likely to be converted, and of course, in many cases, it is the tame land that is most likely to be converted as well. So, you know, it, it um, you know, this is maybe we're stacking of other ecological goods and services on top of a, a protocol like this. If if it could be done, then that would then really distinguish, you know, make a better uh, distinct distinguish better between native and and uh, and tame. Uh, pasture con conservation. Thanks for that answer. A listener named Bea is wondering, if a rancher is not grazing the land at this time, would this money make it worth it for them to not break the land? Or is the expectation to cover the difference between the benefit of grazing and the potential benefit of planting a crop? That's, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Maybe Cedric, could you take take a go at this? Okay. <laughs> I was afraid you're going to swing over. Um, I'm I'm not I'm not sure. And and I I guess um, the way we look at this, and and I don't know, Bea, maybe you can follow up with a bit of context here. But you know, I guess we're assuming that these are actually going to be working landscapes and working land. And I think you know we've identified the importance of having livestock on the grasslands to maintain their ecological function. So um, not sure that this, you know, additional carbon revenue is going to make a big difference, I guess, to that grower. I think it's more um, a reflection of the decision of that of that landowner not to make not to make the conversion. Now, whether or not it stays vacant or it has livestock on it, if it's if the choice is to conserve and not convert, then the payment is is sound. So I, I don't know if that covers off the question very well, Bea, but I don't know, John, Brian, any other follow-up to that? I think maybe the only other thing I would add is that that we have to consider, I guess, some, unfortunately, I guess is, is maybe a bit stronger of a word, but we have to consider the emissions from grazing that occur on that piece, on that parcel of land, um, which does, does reduce the the carbon offset potential um, when grasslands are grazed. Thanks for those answers. Um, Bay mentioned that she'll get a hold of Cedric as well afterwards. So um, love, love to hear from you, Bay. It's been too long. <laughs> Um, our next question is from a listener named Robert, and he asks, what is the actual carbon credit awarded for avoided grassland conversion? That's the question on everybody's lips. <laughs> um, there are so many variables, um, both in the science underlying the protocol, but then also all the other pieces of the protocol that assess the risk, assess the um, the the suitability the financial risk the um, and then of course you know what the specific situation is with with grazing or haying there are so many variables in this protocol that it's 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 very very difficult to give even a, a generic number um, and then of course on top of that you you lay out the the difference in carbon offset prices in different markets or on on the voluntary market you know those those um, those transactions are, are, are private, so there's very little transparency into, into you know, what, what carbon offsets are being uh, sold for on, on voluntary markets. So it's really difficult. Um, a, a rule of thumb that we've been using, but it's a very, very, very general rule of thumb with huge caution applied is about one ton per hectare per year is, is you know, from some preliminary kind of investigation is, around about what we're seeing but it can fluctuate wildly in either either direction <laughs> yeah so if, if i could you know maybe robert if, if you want to know what the opportunity is on your place give us a call let's get you in the pilot project <laughs> Sounds good. A <laughs> uh, listener named Eric is wondering, um, oh, sorry, does the avoided conversion protocol allow for supporting landowners who might not yet be contemplating selling, but are facing financial hardships or looking to improve their management? Yeah, absolutely. That's, um, you know, the, those are the landowners that the carbon offset um, protocol is, is, is supposed to be targeting in terms of 
you know, the the carbon offsets are not going to be the be all and end all of, of they're not going to make that decision for you. They're more of a, you know, a, a smaller incentive on top of all the other decisions that a landowner has to make. Um, but it but it is that um, you know, that cherry on top, I suppose. And right now this this opportunity is available in the in the voluntary market, which which means that carbon offsets generally sell for a lot, a lot less in the voluntary market. Uh, but we're we're expecting, um, you know, uh, if, if we can get this protocol approved in a in a compliance market in Canada, we're expecting that, um, you know, carbon offset prices in in compliance markets in Canada are, are going to significantly in, increase in the next uh, over the next decade. So that could that could be really significant um, change in that narrative actually. Uh, which is why we're through the pilot we're really we're really targeting it and this protocol approved in some Canadian compliance markets too because it would you know just as a general rule of thumb is that could that could change the the sale price by um you know from three or five dollars per offset to uh, you know they're predicting to 170 dollars per offset by 2030 so that's a it's a really significant change Right. Thanks for that answer. Um, a listener named Terry is asking questions way back from the beginning of the presentation, um, but he's wondering, are you accounting for conversion of cropland back to perennial forage in your estimate of annual grassland loss? Um, I assume you're referring to that, those Alberta figures. I think this one. Um, I... I can't remember. I, these are some numbers I pulled about three three years ago for Alberta Nawamp. Um, I honestly can't remember if that if that's the case. <laughs> okay, no problem. Yeah. That's okay. Um, and then listener named Tegan is wondering, will financial viability criteria include considerations about whether the landowner could get more money by converting the land as opposed to conserving it. That's right. Yeah, it's a real estate market, uh, real estate market value assessment of you know what the land is worth uh, on, on the real real estate market as cropland versus what it's worth as grassland. So yeah, it's, it's really getting to that um, kind of proving that there's a financial driver to convert that grassland to annual an annual cropping system to prove that that that. Uh, Grassland is at risk of conversion. Thanks for that answer. Uh, Trevor is wondering, could projects that avoid conversion of forest cover also be eligible? Uh, he's thinking of areas further north in the parkland or even the Peace River country where forest stands may still be threatened by conversion to cropland. Yeah, good question. I, I actually didn't put that on the slide. I, I'll have to up my, update my slide after this, but um, one of the other eligibility criteria in this um, uh, in the protocol is that you can have up to 10% uh, forested area uh, in the in the in the in the project. Now that doesn't mean that if you have a parcel of land that has 50% you know forested area, that's not eligible. That's that's not the case. We just have to cut some of that forested area out of the of the um, out of the project area. Um, uh, that just means that you can't generate carbon offsets for that forested land. And the reason behind that is because the coefficients for this protocol are, are developed for grassland systems, not, not forested systems. Um, but also, you know, the risk um, of conversion of forest, forested land, um, is those risks are very different. Um, and also the risk of, of the soil organic carbon stock loss, uh, you know, even due to natural, natural events uh, is different in forested systems to, to grassland systems. So, there's too much kind of difference between a forest a forest system and a grassland system to be able to um, include significant amounts of forest in this protocol. That makes sense. Um, thanks for that answer. Tracy is wondering, uh, carbon is one service, but when you combine it with habitat, riparian function, etc., value goes up considerably, especially when speaking of native grasslands. Is there any plan to combine valuation? Couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, you know, we're looking at carbon carbon offset markets. Uh, that's what we that's what we we do. That's uh, right now. You know, carbon offset markets are one of the larger ecosystem uh, service markets or environmental markets that are 
that's available globally, I would say, um, kind of leading the way in a lot of respects in terms of environmental markets. So this is a carbon carbon market protocol. However, um, uh, Brian actually mentioned the, the issue of stacking, so stacking of different environmental credits on top top of each other. Um, and, and I think that's really the, the, the reason behind this question is, um, so the Climate Action Reserve have, have said that um, they will consider stacking of multiple offs offsets um, if they if they occur at the at the beginning of the project, the reason for that is um, if 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 a grassland was already receiving you know payments or incentives through for another eco ecosystem uh, service for another yeah let's say what water quality payment for example you know the the that grassland you know could be deemed as not at risk of conversion already because they're already receiving an incentive for an ecosystem good or service um but if you if you stack them all at the beginning of the project and say actually you know the 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 combination of all these incentives means that i'm not going to convert this piece of grassland then that's a different different story yes um a listener named john comments that many native grasses have roots deeper than 50 centimeters what incentive will be provided for landowners to try and maintain or improve native grasses Well, um, I don't know, Brian or Cedric, do you want to take that one? Well, the, the idea, of course, of the, you know, the, the monitoring, you know, the, uh, what we were, you know, so-called roadmap, where we were looking at how management would improve, um, you know, soil carbon wasn't, you know, fixed to any particular depth. So, I mean, it really, you know, as long as it's monitored at depth then we can calibrate models to 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 go to deeper depths so it, it, it certainly intent is to capture you know carbon you know as deep as the deep as we can you know um, feasibly sort of detect change so you know it's not a implicit to the system that we're limiting it to depth it is it is more complicated and complex and sometimes it's hard to detect change to depth with measurements, which is still, you know, the the the, the basis, I guess, of the supporting to the model. So that you know, I don't want to say it's it's we're going to you know estimate carbon change to two meters or something, or, um, but uh, it's certainly not the intent to limit it to some, some shallow depth. And, and so certainly that then can you know the, those increases uh, we can be shown uh, would, would be you know the intent of the the roadmap and the, and the process there of, of having these observations of support models would, would, is, is to, you know, is to be able to capture those kinds of changes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's yeah. a good answer, but I mean, so it's, 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 it's uh, we're aware of it, we want to do it and we're going to try to do it, but you know, there are, there are some challenges. The deeper you go, the harder it is to detect change. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, great, great comments on the carbon, and and couldn't agree more with Brian on on the importance of the roadmap. But just to John's question, you know, what incentive is provided? You know, carbon is just one piece, right? It's kind of a foundational piece, but that stacking issue comes back in again. And we know, you know, the biodiversity richness that goes along with maintaining these native grasslands, especially if they're connected across the landscape to create corridors. So I think there's other incentive programs that we can lay that we need to be considering. You know how do we effectively layer them on carbon to ensure that those you know that that the greatest the ecosystem under the greatest threat around the globe is are these grasslands we need to do everything we can to keep them so stacking outside of carbon hopefully gets us to that point great um james is wondering about how many acres are expected to be impacted by this project as many as possible, I think. <laughs> Great answer. I love it. <laughs> the, the the point of the pilot is to is to test run this with. Um, really, we don't have a top limit of of acres or hectares that we want to include in the pilot. We really want to get a really broad um, uh, understanding of all the different types of projects that could exist across Canada. Test run run them through this protocol and through the team that we've pulled together. Because this, this, uh, these projects will require input from multiple different agencies. That's why we have such a big, big team on the pilot. And um, 
so this, yeah we want to test and refine the protocol and, and update the protocol to to um make it more viable uh, feasible for for more um grasslands across canada but we also want to develop this kind of system between the partners where whereby we can actually generate these um these projects um using each partner's kind of expertise and strengths uh, so we need to sort of build that framework so there's there's two two pieces there that i think you know that the ultimate intent is to is to enable this to scale as as much as possible across canada Great, that's awesome. There's a couple uh, listeners that are wondering about the potential for offsets of converting crop, cropland back to grassland. Um, what are the impediments to a verified protocol for restoration? Yeah, so we uh, we actually have a draft protocol for that exact um, great uh, case. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've 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 tried. Um, to, to get it through some some carbon markets uh, before in the past and not been successful. Um, it's uh, it's still still being considered, I suppose. But um, yeah, absolutely, the intent is to is to go after that type of protocol too. And and the the calf gun as well would um, would would probably be able to provide some some help with um, uh, getting some of the market regulators a bit more comfortable with that type of a protocol. But there's there's certainly interest, you know. Uh, we we work in Alberta. We've we've been working with the Alberta carbon offset system um, for years. Uh, but all you know, lots of other provinces and and the federal government now are all developing their own carbon offset systems. So uh, so there's there's lots of interest now um, across the country, which uh, hopefully will will allow us to uh, pursue that protocol too. Awesome. That's great. Um, Barry comments, it seems like we are headed back to a place where the owner of the gold standard of soil carbon, which is native grassland, that has invested in keeping it there won't be rewarded because the reward will be based on increases in soil carbon. Do you have any comments about that? Well, the, the reward for, for the avoided conversion protocol is for main, that exact case of, of maintaining the existing soil carbon store. Uh, so that that is absolutely the in, the intent of the avoided conversion protocol is that we're re we're rewarding offsets for not converting um, that that grassland and not losing that soil carbon store. Thanks for that answer. Uh, Gail is wondering if you're considering any test areas near cities or towns to potentially reduce urban expansion into agricultural or natural areas. Yeah, we've had this question a few times, eh? And and. Um, <laughs> We haven't got any. I don't think we've got any projects in the in the pipeline fitting that description. But absolutely, we'd like to to include them. Um, they'd be very interesting to uh, to look at, particularly from that financial pressure to convert. Um, would be an interesting piece to look at. Yeah, yeah, it would be. <laughs> Um, Bea is wondering about, um, you mentioned an agreement to conserve grassland. Any idea how long those agreements would be for at this time? So those agreements are, are made between the landowner and um, a land trust, so a qualifying organization that, that's allowed to uh, place those kind of easements or agreements on, on land title. Um, that really is a, is, um, a negotiation between the landowner and, and the land trust. Um, at the moment, my understanding is that most, if not all land trusts, um, uh, their, their agreements are perpetual. However, um, I know that Saskatchewan Stock Growers Association are looking into shorter term um, agreements. Um, and obviously, um, we'd, we'd like to investigate that through this, this protocol. We have, um, th this protocol is based on a US, um, a protocol that was, that was developed in the US. We've actually um, adapted that protocol to Canada. And one of the adaptations that we made was to include the option for shorter term um agreements or easements uh by by using a different type of a accounting system um it would mean that your your carbon offset generation is is reduced by you know that um the the same amount that the the in for the reduction in the term um so so the, yeah so you would get fewer carbon offsets being generated for a shorter term agreement uh but it but it is an option and it's another thing that 
we're going to be exploring during the pilot. Great. Um, Ian is wondering if an easement is required to participate in the pilot. It is not. No, no? we okay. interesting. We want to include um, uh, people. Uh, well, one, we want to get carbon offset projects registered for which you do need a, uh, uh, an easement. Um, but we also want to, like I said, investigate the different types of, of projects that could happen in the future. So we don't want to be um, uh, including landowners who, who absolutely do not want to put an easement on their land, and that that's uh, you know that's a that's a decision that every landowner has to has to has to make. Uh, but if there's a potential that you might want to consider putting a, an easement on on your piece of land, then then absolutely let's talk. Great, thanks for that answer. I think that's all the questions we have um, for today. So I just want to thank you all so much for the fantastic presentation. And, and again, thank you for including us in the launch um, today. We are really excited to be part of, of your announcement. Um, to so all of our listeners, Caitlin, it's been great. Absolutely great. Good, good, good to hear. Um, to all of our listeners out there, thank you so much for catching our second webinar of Prairie's Got the Goods Week. We have another webinar happening today at 3 p.m., and that'll be uh, about the ecological goods and services provided by native prairie grasslands and wetlands from an Indigenous perspective. And you can register for that webinar as well as all the other webinars happening this week on the PCAP website. Um, I would just like to remind everyone again that this webinar has been recorded, so it will be available on the PCAP YouTube channel in the near future, and you're welcome to share it or pass it on to anyone who wasn't able to make it today. Uh, when you leave this webinar, you will get um, uh, an email or something will pop up, and it'll be a quick one-minute survey. If you don't mind filling that out, uh, we really appreciate it. It helps us uh, keep our funding going so we can do a sixth Prairie's Got the Goods week next year. Um, so I guess with that, thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. And we hope to see you later today at our next at our next webinar. Thanks. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you. Bye.